the intent of marriage is not happiness, though that should be a fruit. The intent of marriage is actually making a covenant commitment before God and others that you will serve and sacrifice for the good of this other person. And so I want to encourage you today, don't make a lasting decision based on momentary feelings. Welcome to the Calvary Podcast. For more information about a Calvary campus near you or to join us online, visit our website, calvarycc.global. So last Sunday, we started a a new series in church called The Jesus Way. And we're taking um, three Sundays and six services to focus in on one of Jesus' most famous teachings, which is called the Sermon on the Mount. Reality is, um, you, you can't even begin to understand the man or the message of Jesus without looking at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And so in a moment, we're going to read two verses or a couple of sentences from this famous teaching block by Jesus, but you've got to give it a little bit of context to make sense of it. So uh, about 1,500 years before Jesus walked the planet, uh, the family of Israel, before Israel was a nation, it was a family. And uh, if you want the notes for today's message, by the way, you can scan the QR code on the screen and get that to your Bible app on your phone. Uh, the, the family of Israel were slaves in Egypt for about four centuries. They cried out to God for deliverance and God heard their prayer. Aren't you grateful today that no matter how hard life seems, you can always pray and God always hears your prayer. And, and so they cry out to God and, and God delivers them by raising up a leader called Moses. Well, it's wonderful that they were now free from slavery, but they are a, a people group without a constitution without a rule of law. And so God calls Moses up a mountain called Sinai and there God gives Moses uh, really 10 commandments which become the core of Israel's legal and civil and moral code for generations to come. And so from atop a mountain, God gives Moses what's called a Torah or uh, a a teaching or instruction. He, He literally gives Moses a way to live for the people of Israel. But Moses, as good as he was, understood that he was not the full and final word from God, but God would raise up another who would show us the way to live. Moses himself said in Deuteronomy 18, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. It's to him you shall listen. And so in Jesus' day, people were living with this expectation that there would come one like Moses who would show people God's way to live. Well, 1,500 years later, Jesus steps onto the scene and uh, we see recorded in Matthew's account that Jesus went up on the mountain and when he sat down, his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and he taught them. That's how Matthew sets up the scene for this Sermon on the Mount. And so what Matthew is doing is he is presenting Jesus as the new Moses who from a mountaintop is going to give the new Torah or the new way to live, not the way of the law. He's going to teach us the Jesus way. And how many people would say, if I've got one life, I want to live it the Jesus way. How many people would be honest enough to say, when I live life my way, it never really works out. So so why not try the Jesus way? And so here we get Jesus way of living for you and I. And so six times over in this sermon, or, or teaching block, Jesus quotes from the old law, the law of Moses, with a variant of the line, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you. And uh, Jesus is not contradicting Moses, but what he is doing is rightly interpreting the law that Moses gave by showing us the value that underpins every one of God's commandments. And so we're, we're taking three Sundays to look at these six, you have heard that it was said statements And uh, I don't know about you, but I found last Sunday's two messages, morning and evening, confronting, um, revealing, and really challenging. In fact, I was the preacher on the Sunshine Coast and almost responded to my own altar call. I felt so convicted by the message because it's kind of like heart surgery, these messages. And so if we want to live a life that really aligns with God's way, then we have to pay attention to, to these elements in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, the reason why Jesus had to teach this is because there was a group of religious people called the scribes and the Pharisees, and there's still people with the same kind of approach to life today, who thought that um, the way that you please God is through meticulous rule following. And so they assumed that they were good and right with God on the basis of what they had not, not done. 
So, you know, well, we've not committed adultery and we've not murdered anyone and we love nice people. And so therefore we're good and right with God. And yet Jesus comes and peels back the surface layer of commandments and speaks to the heart. Jesus says, well done, you've not murdered anyone. That's excellent. But is your heart full of anger to people who cross you? Well, well done, you've not cheated on your spouse, but, but are you objectifying and lusting after other people in your heart? Well done, you're nice to people who are nice to you. But reality is anyone can be nice to someone who is nice to them. Jesus peels it back a layer further and goes, well, how do you go with your enemies? Who knows? Jesus is telling us loud and clear. God doesn't just see your actions. God sees your attitudes. God is not just looking for surface level, external religious observance. God is looking for heart level righteousness. Uh, Jesus didn't come just to conform our behavior. Jesus came to transform our heart. C.S. Lewis summed up the idea this way. He said, we may think God wants actions of a certain kind, but God wants people of a certain sort. Why? Because who knows, if our heart is right, then our lifestyle will be right. If our heart is healthy, then our lifestyle will end up being holy because everything we do ultimately flows out of our heart. Who knows, if the fruit is bad, you don't just deal with the fruit, you deal with the tree. Because if the tree is good, the fruit will become good. If the stream is polluted, you you need to deal with the problem upstream. You need to deal with the fountainhead. Because if the fountainhead is pure, the flow that comes from it will be clean. That's why Jesus is always interested in our heart attitude. Jesus summed up this teaching in Matthew 5, 48 by saying something really encouraging. You therefore must be perfect. Anyone feeling slightly intimidated by that command? I always read that and quickly bounced over it because it was too convicting. It's like, that, I, I can't be perfect. Uh, I've got a mother-in-law. She reminds me all the time that I'm not. And so perfect there doesn't mean never made a mistake. Perfect literally just means complete. It means whole. It means mature. And here's the point. Jesus wants that our hearts are made whole. Because if our hearts are made whole, then the way that we live will end up being healthy, God-honoring and helpful to others. And so so that really is the sentiment behind this series. And I find that at this time of year, term four, it's about the right time to let God just do a little bit of open heart surgery because I started the year as a Christian, but by, by October, I'm just hanging in there. By October, a few people have offended me. A few people have maybe, you know, rubbed me up the wrong way. A few people might've let me down and who knows it's possible to be living all the right way externally, but for your heart to be getting misaligned on the, no one's willing to say amen. The preacher's the only one who goes through issues. Is that right? Who knows? It's very possible. God doesn't just see the observance. He sees the heart. And God is most interested in our hearts coming right. So last Sunday morning, we talked about anger. And uh, that was pretty convicting. And, uh, and then last Sunday night, we pro- uh, spoke about lust. And maybe you're not normally in a night service. I'd encourage you to, to download, get a hold of the message from last Sunday night. We talked about OnlyFans, we talked about porn, we talked about lust. It was like real talk. We gave a trigger warning, sent the kids out, and then just had a grown-up talk. And so um, you might want to get a hold of that. That was a really helpful message. Today, we are on saying number three from this teaching. So we're in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 31. Uh, It says this, It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. I want to speak this morning about marriage, betrayal, and the cross. And uh, just as I was prepping my message and going over my notes this morning, I I remembered that I'd lost my wedding ring. So I just want to point out, um, Sarah and I are good. (laughs) Just, I took it off and lost it. Uh, Now, I'm, I'm really aware that even as I've read these two verses by Jesus this morning, All of us receive these two verses very differently. There would be some people in church today and you've never been married. And so these two verses just feel like, you know, additional nice teaching along with all of Jesus' other nice teaching. There'll be other people here and uh, you're married and you're enjoying it. And so these verses might feel largely irrelevant. Uh, I want to encourage you, don't tune out because there's going to be things today that are going to help every person who's married. I'm aware today there'll be some people here who are married and you're not enjoying your marriage. And so already you're starting to feel a little bit nervous about the content. And there'll be some of us here today in church who have walked through the pain of divorce 
and now you find yourself single or remarried and you're not feeling a little nervous, you're feeling a lot nervous and maybe a little condemned. Let me just say this from the outset. Um, my goal in the next 25 minutes is not to browbeat anyone, not to condemn anyone, but what we want to do together is we want to actually consider not just Jesus' command, but we want to peel back the surface layer and see the value that undergirds the command that Jesus is giving us. It's really important whenever we approach these kind of texts that we remember that God's commands for our life are not arbitrary. They're not random. It's not like heaven had a committee meeting and said, oh, we need to come up with 10 rules. Let's come up with some rules. Ha! Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. No divorce. Write that down. No, no, that's not how it works. All the commands that Jesus give us issue and flow out of his character. They are a reflection of his own nature. And the reason why Jesus, generally speaking, is against divorce is because divorce is at odds with his own character. And we're going to talk about that as we land this message today. And so what we want to do today is is not just unpack what Jesus taught here, but we want to place it alongside the Bible's broader vision for marriage. And so to do this, we have to go not just to Matthew 5, we have to go to Matthew chapter 19, where Jesus is asked a question about this. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 3 says, And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him. No, they're testing him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And he answered, Haven't you read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Some people are like, I've heard that before at weddings. It's from the good book. Um, They said to Jesus, well, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? Jesus said to them, because of the hardness of heart, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And so let me give you the spoiler alert up front. If if you're like, oh, Dustin's preaching on this topic, I can't wait till he gives like a really simple yes, no answer to the question of divorce. If that's how you want me to approach this topic, let me give you the spoiler alert up front. You are going to be thoroughly disappointed by today's message as you are by many of my sermons. And so here's the reality. Here's the reality. We tend to love neat, tidy answers. Give me the neat, tidy answer. What is wrong and right in this one? Give me the yes or no on this. But who knows, life is not always neat and tidy. If you've you've orbited uh, on this earth for a a few years, you realize that things are not always neat and tidy. And I've found that the wisdom of the Bible gives us principles more than it does rules. And and so what we're going to do today, rather than taking a simplistic approach of asking, is divorce okay, yes or no? What I want to do in the next 21 minutes and 30 seconds is I want to present to you five principles that inform our approach to marriage and relationships. And if you look at life through the lens of these five principles, it's going to help us to live in the wisdom of God. Here's number one. Marriage and divorce have been personal, painful, and divisive issues for a long, long time. You know, sometimes it's tempting to think, well, the problem with people today, the problem with culture today is, you know, people people today don't take their vows seriously, but back in the good old days, everyone was faithful, as if divorce never occurred until the 21st century. But that's not the case. Who knows, the reason Jesus is asked a question about divorce is because divorce was a painful and divisive issue then, just as it is today. In fact, in Jesus' day, divorce and remarriage was widely accepted and practiced in that first century culture. In fact, there were, there were various schools of thought or various approaches to this topic. In fact, there was three different rabbinical schools that had three different philosophies based off alternate readings of an Old Testament verse found in Numbers 24, 24 verse 1. The first school of thought was from the school of Shammai. Uh, Rabbi Shammai taught that a man may not divorce his wife unless she was unfaithful to him. But then there was the school of Hillel. And the school of Hillel said a man may divorce his wife even if she spoiled a dish for him. Matt, why did you leave your wife? Man, she, she burnt the risotto every time. And I just think God's got better for me than that. So I've moved on. 
The third one was Rabbi Akiba. He was even more controversial. He taught a man may divorce his wife if he has found another woman prettier than her. Rabbi Akiba didn't have many women in his church. So here's the observation. Marriage has always been a difficult topic. And divorce has always been controversial and separated people in different camps of opinion for a long, long time. And so when the Pharisees come to Jesus and ask what he thinks about divorce, they're not coming because they want to learn from him. They're coming because they want to throw a gotcha question at him. They're they're lobbing a grenade to him in front of a live audience because they know that there are three schools of thought and this is a very divisive issue. And what they're trying to do is throw this gotcha question at Jesus so they can discredit him and divide his followers three ways. But Jesus doesn't even get into the reeds of the argument. Instead, Jesus reaches right back to the second chapter of the Bible by quoting Moses and saying, therefore, a man will leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Those words hold fast. It literally is the idea of being glued to something, that when two become one, they are glued to one another. In our grandparents' generation, they used used to use the word to cleave. You would leave and cleave when you got married, and to cleave was to unite to someone through a covenant. So here's the second principle. The second principle on our vision of marriage and, uh, and relationships is this, that God created marriage to be a sacred and lifelong covenant. Now, sometimes young people assume that if you feel passionate feelings of romance for someone, you marry them so that you can enjoy those passionate feelings of romance for the rest of your life. But who knows, the essence of marriage is not passionate feelings of romance. There's a lot of spouses here, not sure if they should amen at this point. The essence of marriage is not passionate feelings of romance, the essence of marriage is sacrificial commitment for the good of another. That's the essence of marriage. Perhaps one of the reasons why we struggle with the idea of lifelong marriage vows is because most of our other relationships in life are consumer relationships. Think about it. Uh, You've got a relationship with your accountant because he does your tax return. You've got a relationship with your internet service provider because you need that for your house. You've got a relationship with your electrician because you need some wiring done or something fixed in your home. You've got a relationship with the streaming service. You know, you entered into a relationship with Netflix. And I've got to be honest, I'm seeing um, Stan and Amazon Prime on the side as well. And, um, and, And you've got a relationship with your spouse. So I've got all of these relationships in my world. Well, who knows, consumer relationships last about as long as a vendor meets your needs at a price you are willing to pay. But if another vendor comes along and delivers better services at a better cost, why would I stay in the relationship with the original vendor? You'll switch to a new accountant. You'll find a new internet service provider. You'll find a new streaming service if it provides better service at a lower cost. You see, and I want, this will come on screen in a moment, you'll see in a consumer relationship, the needs of the individual are more important than the relationship itself. But the nature of a covenant relationship is very different. You see, in a covenant relationship, it's the good of the relationship that is more important than the needs of the individual. Can you see how the whole fundamental nature of the relationship is different? Christopher Leish, who's a historian, he said this, it is the logic of consumerism that undermines the values of loyalty and permanence and promotes a different set of values that is destructive to family life. Now, who knows, a consumer mindset is fine when you're assessing what car you will drive or what mobile phone you will use. But a consumer mindset is problematic if we take that mindset and use it to assess our spouse. Why? Because your spouse is not a commodity. It's got real quiet in church today. Your spouse is not a commodity. Your spouse is an image bearer of God. And your family and your legacy were never meant to be disposable like a mobile phone. Who knows, if you switch phone plan, the collateral is small. But if you switch spouse, the collateral is enormous. Listen, when Jesus was quizzed about divorce, what he did is he affirmed that the essence of marriage is not consumption. The essence of marriage is covenant. 
And who knows, we do well to pay attention to this again today. Not only is marriage a covenant relationship, but it's a unique covenant because it's a covenant that has vertical and horizontal elements to it. In Malachi chapter 2 and verse 14, it says, the Lord was witness. In other words, God was watching. God was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. And so Malachi says, listen, the covenant that you made with your spouse, that was made before God. It's not just a horizontal covenant. It's got a vertical element to it. That's why if you go to a traditional wedding ceremony, there's two sets of vows that the couple will make. The first set of vows they'll make are the ones where they say, I do. And, and, and traditionally, the couple will face the minister or the pastor when they, when they say the words, I do, because they're acknowledging that the first vow they are making is not with their spouse. The first vow they are making is before God. That's why they face the minister when they say that. Then they turn direction, they face one another, and they make their second vows to one another because the marriage covenant is a covenant that is hor- uh, horizontal, that is vertical and it's horizontal. Now, some would say, Dustin, do you really believe that? Get with the times. Isn't a wedding ceremony just a piece of paper? Why do we need all that covenant stuff and all the legal side of it? I'll tell you why. A covenant really matters because the promises of covenant are meant to carry us through the ebb and flow of feelings and affections. Who knows? There are moments when you're married where you feel romance and you feel affection, and there are other moments where you just feel nothing. Again, no one's willing to amen. But let's be real today. There there are good times and there are tough times. Every relationship has its ebbs and flows. And that's why it saddens me when, when, when I hear that two people are getting a divorce just because they're not feeling in love anymore. We, we just, we fell out of love. It's not making me happy anymore. I always think, what were you expecting? You got married to get happy? If you want to get happy, don't go to a wedding chapel, go to Disneyland. If you want to get happy, go to a footy game, go to time zone, take yourself out for dinner. Don't get married to get happy. Who knows? The the intent of marriage is not happiness, though that should be a fruit. The intent of marriage is actually making a covenant commitment before God and others that you will serve and sacrifice for the good of this other person. And so I want to encourage you today, don't make a lasting decision based on momentary feelings. Um, There's an article written by Linda White, which uh, her article is entitled, Does Divorce Make People Happy? Findings from a Study of Unhappy Marriages. And she cites broad and long studies that reveal that two-thirds of unhappy marriages will actually become happy if the people stay married and don't get divorced. Within five years, two-thirds of unhappy marriages will actually become happy. And so I want to encourage you today, if if you're part of Calvary Church and, and your marriage is not happy at the moment, I, I, I get that. We're all creatures of feelings. You can have good seasons where the feelings are present and you can have seasons where the feelings are absent. But, but I would encourage you to stick at it because when you made a marriage vow, you didn't make a vow to feel a certain way for the rest of your life. You made a vow to act a certain way for the rest of your life. And it's not just the Bible. Studies show that if you will just keep on, keep on acting lovingly towards your spouse, within five years, two thirds of marriages will actually find that the feelings return. Is this making sense today? And besides, it'll take you longer than five years to disentangle all the legal matters anyway. So you might as well just stick at it and let the happiness return. Psalm 92 verse 12 says this. By the way, I know this is a really frank talk. That's okay. We always say church is meant to be relevant to Monday. Who knows this is one of the most relevant things about Monday. Psalm 92 verse 12 says this. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon, Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. You know, often that verse is preached about, you know, being planted in a local church. And certainly I believe that. But who knows, there's a lesson there in our relationships as well. You you can't just uproot yourself when the seasons and the feelings change and then expect to flourish. But when we plant, when we put down roots, when we stay loyal and committed in the long term, we end up flourishing. And and so that's the ideal that Jesus presents. A man will leave his father and his mother, hold fast, be glued to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That's God's ideal for marriage, but who knows life is not always ideal. It's a reality. And so the the Bible 
recognizes that sometimes our reality does not always match the ideal. I've heard someone once say that at first marriage is ideal and then it's an ordeal, then they feel like they got a raw deal, then they're looking for a new deal. Because that can be the truth. Marriage can be hard and not ideal. And, and, and God actually sees that and acknowledges that. That's why Jesus goes on in verse 7 of chapter 19, says, they said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? And he said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, it was not so. Here's the third principle. Divorce is disruptive, it's painful, and sometimes it's necessary to prevent greater harm. Here's the reality. You get two imperfect people together in the same home and just say, get along, good luck. Who knows, it doesn't always work out because we are all sinful. We all miss the mark by, by birth, by nature, and by choice. And, and, and Jesus is saying that sometimes human hearts become so hard that it leads a spouse to violate their covenant. And this is why God doesn't live in fantasy land. God knows real life. This is why Moses and Jesus permitted divorce, not as a commandment, but as a concession, not so that people could just get away with whatever they want. It was given as a concession for innocent people who find themselves married to a spouse who has broken their vows via sexual immorality. This is what Jesus is saying. Now, now we, need to, we, we need to acknowledge the destructive nature of this kind of behavior. I know that Ashley Madison and Hollywood glamorize affairs, but the reality is they bring massive destruction. They bring broken trust. They bring anguish. They bring a shattering of self-worth. And so the Bible doesn't command divorce on these grounds, but it does permit it. Why? It's because it would be some type of strange cruelty for a God to insist that an innocent spouse be bound by a covenant that the other party has violated. And so this is not lost on God, which is why Jesus points out that sexual immorality can be grounds for divorce. But but let me also note that it can also, this occasion can also be grounds for forgiveness. I know many couples in our church who've walked through this dark road and yet have come to the other side of it and have built lasting and joy-filled and trusting marriages through the, the, the extension of forgiveness and the repairing of relationship. Who knows that as a Christian, you and I are all people who have received the undeserved grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. And so a Christian person, doesn't mean life is perfect, and it doesn't mean you have to go this way, but a Christian person does have the resources at their disposal with which to forgive, to reconcile, and to rebuild. And so I want to say to anyone today, if you find yourself in that situation, God sees the reality of the pain of it. And yet sometimes there can be opportunity to forgive and to have hope again for your future. Other times uh, where the Bible says divorce may be necessary is in the case of desertion. That's 1 Corinthians 7, where if someone just leaves, like, what are you meant to do then? You can't force a spouse to come back. If someone leaves and abandons the covenant, then, then obviously that puts someone in a position where the covenant has been broken. And uh, I would also say that domestic violence falls into this category as well, because domestic violence represents such a violation of the marriage covenant to care for and respect the other. And so even though Jesus and Paul didn't say it, I believe it reflects the heart of Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, it's also in alignment with what the Australian Christian Church's movement, of which Calvary is a part, recognises that uh, DV can be can be just so destructive and so damaging that it can be grounds for divorce as well. And so here's the reality. The reality is when you glue together two imperfect people and then try to separate them, if you've ever glued your hands together and then tried to separate, it's, don't try that at home when you get, when it's, not, it's not a practical, it's not homework, but But if you glue your hands together, it's painful to separate. Why? Because that's a picture of what marriage is. When you separate, it's painful. And that's why when when the Pharisees come to Jesus and say, so like, when am I allowed to divorce my wife? It just rings so hollow. Jesus is like, don't you get it? This is a weighty matter. This is not a trivial thing. It it would be like this. It would be like a child, your child coming to you and saying, "Um, hey, mom, hey, dad. 
When am I allowed to expose my body to radiation? Who knows, as a loving parent, you would probably say, never. We never want you to expose your body to radiation. We want you to be happy and healthy. Radiation is going to harm you. But, but then imagine your child has stage four cancer. Who knows, everything about how you approach this situation just changed. In that instance, radiation could be helpful to reduce or eradicate the damage that is already occurring. And so radiation still hurts because it harms good tissue. It's still painful. But in this situation, the damage of radiation can actually prevent even a far worse form of harm from the cancer. The analogy is not perfect, but it helps us to understand why the Bible doesn't command or promote divorce, but why in some cases it permits it. And so let me say this, I know we're we're going through heavy waters right now. If you're in church and you relate to anything I've talked about in the last seven minutes, I would encourage you with this. You don't have to do the journey alone. There are, there are people in this church, there are pastors, there are a team, there are godly people. You can help, uh, we can help you access godly counselors who can help you to journey through this because I just believe that in Jesus, there is always wisdom, there is always hope, there is always light, and there is always the possibility of a better tomorrow. Can you say amen? And so that's the third principle we have to keep in mind. Here's the fourth one. Jesus greatly loves and cares for all people. Single, married, widowed, divorced, and remarried. Um, I think we need to acknowledge that in this area of marriage and divorce, churches have not always done well. In fact, on some occasions, churches have failed in this area because people who are experiencing the fracturing of marriage have come to church and then been made to feel outcast or judged or ignored. And so when that happens, the difficulty of divorce is then compounded by the harshness and shame from the hand at the hands of some Christians. And so I think we need to acknowledge this, that if a friend or a family member has experienced the pain or is walking through the pain of divorce, I think we all do well to keep in mind that that individual never entered into a marriage with a vision to end up divorced. Things have not gone according to plan. And so shouldn't our first response not be judgment? Shouldn't our first response be care? If you're in a Christian faith community and you find out someone's walking through this, our response is not, well, I've got a verse for that. Our response should be, hey, can I hear some of your story? You catch what I'm saying today? Um, in John chapter 4, Jesus has a conversation with uh, a woman. We don't know her name. We just know her as a Samaritan woman. And as the conversation unfolds, we learn that this woman has had five husbands and the man that she's with now, the sixth guy, is not her husband. Now, I've been in church a long time and I've heard this verse preached a lot, a lot of times and I've even preached it. And, and often when, when I've heard it preached, it's been preached with a, a bit of an undertone of shame on the woman because clearly she was a promiscuous woman. If she's been married five times and now is with the sixth guy, clearly she's got some problems. And the, the subtle or sometimes not subtle message has been, it doesn't matter how bad your sin and shame is. It doesn't matter how bad and immoral your past is. It's all right, Jesus can forgive you. But But then as I was preparing for this message and I learned more about the context, it made me rethink the story. In that culture, women didn't have many legal rights. So it's pretty unlikely she's just bouncing from bed to bed to bed to bed to bed. More likely this woman has experienced the pain of desertion or she's been discarded or she's been widowed five times already. And so she's going to the well in the heat of the day, racked with shame and a sense of inferiority. And what does Jesus give her? Jesus doesn't go, oh, married five times. I've got a Bible verse for that. What does Jesus do? He gives her his time. He gives her dignity. He affirms her value. He gives her hope and a future. And and can I just say, maybe us Jesus followers should all take a leaf out of Jesus' book and the way he responds to people who have walked through the difficulty of relationship separation. Come on, are you with me today, church? I know it's heavy waters, but stay with me. Because reality is, the Samaritan woman didn't get married for the first, second, third, fourth, or fifth time with a vision for this one to bust up as well. Probably she was not the cause of divorce. Probably she was the casualty of divorce. And when people have been the casualty of divorces, our assumption should not be, well, I'm going to leap in with judgment because clearly they've got big sin issues. No, clearly they've actually walked through some stuff. And reality is 
I've walked through some stuff as well. The challenges I'm facing might be different to the challenges you're facing, but how can I give you dignity? How can I affirm your value? And how can I give you a listening ear and point you to Jesus in the midst of this season? Hey, if you're part of Calvary Church and you've walked through or are walking through this, I just want to let you know that the heart of Calvary Church it is not to treat marriage as a light flippant issue. We've already established that principle, but to say, hey, life is not always ideal. Stuff happens. And when stuff happens, you know who you find at the well? You find Jesus at the well, giving dignity, love, and hope to every single person. Number five is this, marriage pictures Jesus' faithfulness to us and his desired loyalty toward him. Let let me close with this. Remember how he said at the start of the message that, that the commands are not random. The commands are actually an extension of God's character. And this is true nowhere more else than it is right here. This command that Jesus gives flows from the nature and the character of God himself. It's incredibly true in this situation. Who knows, to ditch someone because they they no longer meet your standards, that is a million miles from the character of Jesus. Who knows, to, to be unfaithful to someone and to break your covenant, that is the exact opposite of what Jesus is like. You see, when God went looking for a relational analogy with which to describe his intended relationship with you and I, with the church. He didn't reach for the relationship of customer vendor. No, Jesus reached for the relationship of husband and wife. The church, you and I, we are called the bride of Christ. And Jesus is the groom. Sorry, fellas, we're all the bride on this one. We're called the the bride of Christ. In other words, when, when God wanted to convey his intended relationship and his relational posture to you and I. It wasn't vendor, customer. No, it was husband and wife. Why? Because God wants us to see that at the heart of God, the heart of his character is this, that God is faithful. How many people would say, you know what? I've found God to be a faithful God. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus himself forged a covenant with us the night before he was crucified when he took bread and broke it and he took the cup and drank it. And it was a picture of his body and his blood, which would be the covenant emblems that he would forge with you and I. Who knows when Jesus died upon the cross, giving up his life for his bride, Jesus didn't look down from the cross and say, you know what? I'm giving my life for you because you are so attractive to me. Jesus didn't die on the cross saying, I'm giving my blood for you because you've been so faithful to me. Jesus didn't say, I'm giving myself to you because you're so compatible with me. No, the reality is today that you and I were still sinners. We were still denying Jesus, abandoning Jesus, betraying Jesus. And you know how Jesus responded to our betrayal? How did Jesus respond to our denial? How did Jesus respond to our unfaithfulness? Let me tell you how he responded. He said, He stayed upon the cross and died in our place in the greatest act of history. Why? Because if you cut God, He bleeds faithfulness. That is the kind of God we serve. That's why the Bible says in 2 Timothy, if we are faithless, He remains faithful. Why? Not because God feels faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. It's who God is. God is faithful. And and I just think that's why the Jesus way is loyalty. Now, now, receive this in light of the other five principles, okay? If you're in a DV marriage, I'm not saying be like Jesus and stay. You got to see it in light of the five principles. But what I am saying is this, that, that as followers of Jesus, as much as it's within our power, we should be people who are marked by loyalty. Why? Because our God is a loyal God. We should be people who are marked by faithfulness. Why? Because our God is a faithful God. We should be the kind of people who, whether we feel it or not, we stay and we serve and we give our best for the sake of other people. Why? Because that's what our God is like. The Jesus way is not flippancy. The Jesus way is not, well, I'm not getting what I want out of it. I'm going to dice. No, the Jesus way is to be faithful, loyal, covenant people. And I just think it's because Jesus is all of those things to us that we might have the resource to extend that to other people as well. You might say, but but no one in my family line has ever had a functional, healthy marriage. Well, welcome to a new line. You've been born again, the family of God. And the way it rolls in the family of God is we have a covenant keeping God. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Hey, life is not always beautiful. Life is tough. 
We've acknowledged that, but God is always good. Come on, why don't we stand to our feet? Hope you're doing okay. I know that for some of us today, it's like, oh, cute sermon, Dustin. That was nice. For others of us, that might be the hardest sermon you've ever heard. But, but let me just say, for all of us, God's grace and help is available. So come on, why don't we lift our hands to heaven? Whether you're married, single, engaged, widowed, wherever you find yourself, come on, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, you are so faithful. God, we acknowledge that all of us have been faithless. All of us in our heart have wandered and strayed from you. And yet, God, you meet our unfaithfulness with covenant faithfulness. Lord, I just pray that that might stir within us a loyalty toward you and to the people that we relate with. Lord, I just pray for those today who find home to be really difficult in this season. God, I just pray grace and wisdom, strength, hope to fill every heart. Father, for those of us who perhaps say, no, we're doing good. Lord, I just pray, let homes be rich. God, let relationships in our personal world really be blessed of God, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. For more information about a Calvary campus near you or to join us online, visit our website, calvarycc.global.